you. So I'm very excited to be here today, partly because I actually started virtue genomics when I was a student. So I was originally a grad student at UCLA when I first started becoming interested in the drug discovery process. And it was in that moment I realized how broken drug discovery is right now. It's still largely a guessing game, but we're in this really unique moment of time right now where advances in genomics and machine learning are really poising us to rethink the way we do drug discovery and take a lot of the guesswork out of drug discovery. And so I started Verge really with a vision of creating a scalable drug discovery engine that could be repeated not just for one disease, but across many different diseases, and eventually apply to even larger human conditions such as aging, disease prevention, and addiction. So I want to start out with kind of why I went into the field in the first place, which is for the patients. And at Verge, our first disease area that we focused in is in ALS. So ALS is a rapidly degenerating disorder in which patients progressively become paralyzed, losing their ability to walk, to eat, and eventually to breathe. And unfortunately, because most of these patients die within three years, and under our current drug discovery system, it takes over 15 years just to find a single new drug, most of these patients won't get the drugs that they need. At Verge, we've been able to use artificial intelligence to identify over a dozen promising drug candidates that are showing effect in our preclinical models. They're showing effect in mice that we've engineered with ALS in them. So I'm about to show you a video of three mice that have ALS. And they're at the kind of initial early stages of ALS where they're starting to lose their ability to walk and their muscles are starting to waste. And so you can see that these muscles, these uh, mice are already losing their ability to walk and have a hard time staying on this rotating wheel. But when we give these very same ALS mice injections of a drug discovered entirely by our platform, they recover their ability to walk and stay on this rotating wheel. And what's so exciting about this drug is that it's actually just one of many drugs that we've identified showing promising effects in the lab, but also one of many diseases that we're currently pursuing. And that's really what is so exciting to me about this platform is the potential to find drugs not just for one disease, but to eventually scale across many different diseases. And at Verge, we're building an engine really with the vision of creating and helping enable a world in which cures exist for every single human disease out there without an available treatment. But first I wanna start by taking you through kind of my personal story and where it all began. Because if you had asked me five years ago or told me five years ago that you would be a CEO of a biotech company, I probably would have laughed. <laughs> I'd be like, never in a million years. Um, so I was born in the DC area um, and here are my parents. They're immigrants from China. This is a picture of me from what my friends called the Bruce Lee era, because apparently I look like Bruce Lee with an awesome haircut and monochromatic jumpsuit. Um, but really it was a, a unique moment, like shortly thereafter, um, around middle school, when I started realizing <coughs> what death was, kind of dark and morbid, but um, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I was like, you know, what do I want to be thinking in the very last moment on my deathbed? What is the last thought I want to have? And I realized that what I wanted to be thinking was that I have made the maximum amount of impact on the world that I know I could have. And in fact, because I was kind of neurotic, I also had this like formula in my head where I was like, I will maximize for like the greatest delta per patient across the greatest number of patients in the shortest period of time. So that led me to science because you know, I thought at the time, what better way to really impact people than to really change the way they interact with their bodies and the way they live their lives. So I actually went to the National Institutes of Health and had my first science experience in high school, which to be honest, I absolutely hated. I was at the bench, I was pipetting, I was like doing these molecular biology experiments. Uh, and it was a very classical kind of old school form of molecular biology, which teaches us that one gene in your DNA always corresponds to one protein. 
And there are scientists that dedicate their entire lives to actually just studying one gene to, in hopes of finding a link to disease. But this all changed one day when one day during lab meeting, this uh, mem lab member got up and uh, gave a lab meeting. And his name is Dr. Wuchti, Stefan Wuchti, and he was this Austrian biophysicist. And I was kind of like, what is a physicist doing in a cancer biology lab? But then he showed in his meeting these beautiful network diagrams of hundreds of different genes. And so it turns out that the story is much more complex. It turns out there are over 22,500 genes in our genome, each of which uh, together encode for over 100,000 proteins. And he asked, what if instead of studying one gene at a time, we actually looked at how all of these genes interact to cause disease? And it was just something that was so obvious to me. I couldn't stop thinking about it the next night. I was like, you know, like, what can I do to get involved? This makes so much sense that we look at hundreds of genes at a time to study disease. So the next day, I went up to his door and I knocked on his door and I asked, hey, is there, how can I get involved in more projects? And in a very kind of gruff European way, he was like, well, why don't you just go and code up, like, find all 100,000 proteins in the human proteome, put together a map, and come back to me when you're done. And oh, by the way, you'll need to know Python. And being a high school student, I was like, oh, OK, cool. Yeah, we will do. And I left his office. I beelined straight for my desk. And I immediately Googled, what is Python? And that is legitimately how I learned how to code, which was really just driven by this burning desire to really understand how these biological networks worked. And unbeknownst to me, this was actually part of a larger historical narrative that was happening at the time. You see, in the 1950s, we had the molecular biology revolution, which really gave us the tools to study one gene at a time. And this enabled companies such as Genentech, Biogen, and Amgen to start. But in the 2000s, we had the genomics revolution. The human genome was sequenced, which gave us the tools to study tens of thousands of genes at once. And this meant drug discovery was no longer a biology problem, but it became a data science problem. It became a physics problem. It became a problem of multiple disciplines. And I believe that the next generation of biotech companies will rely on integrating all of these disciplines together to be successful. And so this is my kind of second turning point. So I'm kind of going to walk through a series of turning points um, that I felt like set me up for uh, starting the company, even though I didn't know at that time. And this is a really critical one. So fast forward a few years later, I'm in college, um, and I'm studying in the lab of Saeed Tabazoe, who is one of the pioneers in genomics and cancer biology. And so at the time, it was the end of my senior year in college, and I was thinking, you know, I think the MD-PhD might really be the best way to tackle that life mission of mine, which was to make as much impact as possible. But I was 20 at the time. The MD-PhD program is like eight years at minimum, up to 12 to 15 years. And I just like was having this existential crisis. I could not fathom what eight years meant, uh, nor could I commit to anything. I was like, do I really want to be a physician scientist? How do I even know? Like, do I really want to be a doctor? And he kind of sat me down he, and he told me, like, look, Alice, there's no way that you know that you will want to become a doctor unless you just start medical school. And you won't know if you want to be a professor unless you just start graduate school. You know, if you don't like it, you know, you can always just leave or pivot. You're not committed to it for the rest of your life. But at least then you will not have left any rock unturned and you'll just have gotten started. And so that was a really, a really big light bulb moment for me. And I think to this day, I see so many people get stuck on these paths that they think they've committed to and really have their lives ruled by this kind of sunk cost <laughs> fallacy. And in reality, you'll never know. You'll never know whether or not a path is right for you unless you just take the first step, unless you just get started. Um, and that was just really big for me throughout the rest of my career. <laughs> Ironically, it was also a big theme for me when I decided to leave the MD-PhD. Uh, so this is in 2010 uh, when I began my MD-PhD uh, with 11 other colleagues. 
Interestingly, actually four of these people did not end up finishing the program. Um, and I actually met my co-founder, who's that guy uh, right behind me, on this very day this picture was taken. And so when I started medical school, in a lot of ways, it was profoundly fulfilling. You know, I got to see these patients every day. It felt like I was making an impact on individual patients and their families. But I couldn't keep this kind of gnawing feeling I was having that, you know, that was it. You know, I could see patients and it would be impactful for them, but there was a limit to how many patients I could see in my lifetime. And so I transitioned to the PhD, and that's when I started focusing on drug discovery for my thesis, and specifically on the very earliest stages of drug discovery. So right now, in even the first phase of drug discovery, it takes about five years and of over a quarter billion dollars to even just screen through drugs and find drugs that work. And this is because a lot of pharma companies are paying for failures. So oftentimes their brute force screening tens to hundreds of thousands of compounds just to identify one that works in the lab. And I thought there must be a better way to do this. And so back in grad school, I started coding up some of the first algorithms to find new drugs for nerve regeneration. So spinal cord injury, nerve injury. And quite shockingly, the very first drug that was predicted by the algorithm, when we put it into mice with crushed nerves, helped them recover function of their nerves much faster than even the leading standard. And this was just the first drug we tested. And so when compared to kind of the current pharma success rate, I thought, wow, this is really a compelling finding. But when I was writing it up for publication, I was writing up the manuscript, I kind of thought, like, do I want to just publish this and let it sit on a bookshelf somewhere? Or what is the best path to actually get getting this product to patients? And I realized that really, if I wasn't going to be the one to push it out, there'd be very few other people that would be as qualified to really advance this to commercialization. And I think the second thing that was happening for me at the time was I went into this PhD with really big hopes that I could make a discovery that would impact millions. But what I realized was the kind of realities of day-to-day -day academia were very much still focused on publications first, um, and not so much on direct patient translation. So in many ways, it's ironic because the actual reason I went into the MD PhD ended up all being also the reason I left, which was I found that starting a startup was the most direct fulfillment of creating patient impact as quickly as possible. This is also another reason I ended up leaving my program, which was uh, we got into Y Combinator. And so I actually learned about Y Combinator um, through two Google searches. Uh, the first was, what is an incubator? And then the second one was, what is the best incubator in the world? And it, this was the first thing, so I clicked on it. And I realized that the applications were due in about a week. So my co-founder and I went and we like, spent a week writing up this application. And the day before it was due, I gave it to a friend that had started a startup. And he just tells me, Alice, you're going to need to forget everything they taught you in grad school and write this like you would write it for your mom so your mom could understand. And that was another light bulb moment for me, which was like, they've taught me the specific way to write and the specific jargon in grad school that I had to unlearn. But that was also a huge lesson for me in just entrepreneurship, which is the first step is actually learning how to communicate your idea in a way that's as simple as possible and figure out what people you're talking to care about and communicate it to why they should actually care about your idea. Um, so I actually ended up scrapping in, pulling an all-nighter, <laughs> rewriting it, actually thinking that my mom was going to read it, um, and we got in. And so I kind of want to end with, and at least this section, with a lot of people ask me, and they say, oh, you must have been so brave to leave the grad school program or to make the leap. But the honest answer is it never felt like a leap. It always felt like a next step. And it, it felt like the next step towards answering just a long list of questions. And I felt, feel like that's a lot of what uh, entrepreneurship is. So the first question for us was, 
will anyone even care about this idea? <laughs> and luckily, we found that YC did care. And then the next question was, can we actually get funding <coughs> to grow our idea? And the question after that was, can we build an initial team to actually build the product? And can we actually grow a team to take the product to the next level? So really, this was just a kind of a cascading journey of individual steps. Um, but it really taught me that the most important thing is to just stay adaptable. And I think that people get so caught up in trying to figure out, like, where do I want to end up? What is the best path there? Um, is this really where I want to be? When in reality, you can never really know. And the best thing you can do is just to take the next step to find out more information, if that is uh, true or not. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that I face specifically when building an AI and drug discovery company. Um, and so when I first started, I realized that one of the biggest barriers right now from f preventing AI from fully realizing its potential in drug discovery are these huge silos that exist between different industries. There are silos that exist between computational teams, biology, chemistry, drug development, and even academia and industry. And the first thing I wanted to do was to create a team that broke down some of these silos. So we really set out from day one to create this truly integrated team that combines top experts in machine learning and statistics with drug developers, neurobiologists, and chemists. And it's been so important to have these people sitting side by side with each other because the computational people really understand what they're making. They really understand what their product needs to look like. And the biologists can design experiments that produce the right types of data for the computational team. I think another challenge that we faced when we first started was a lot of companies have trouble figuring out how they actually create value from their algorithms. And so we decided from day one that we didn't want to just be a software company, but we actually wanted to own the products or the potential billion dollar drugs that would come out of our platform. So what we did from day one was create a vertically integrated company. What that means is that we have both the front end of our machine learning uh, algorithms, as well as the, our own in-house drug discovery and animal facilities and labs. So this allows us to actually create our own sets of proprietary data by sourcing thousands of different patient brains and sequencing it ourselves and mining this data to figure out what are the groups of genes or gene networks that are causing disease. By looking at these gene networks, we've been able to build a robust first-in-class drug portfolio of over a dozen breakthrough opportunities in six different diseases, and importantly, because we have our own integrated labs, we can quickly turn these predictions into real drugs, as well as see if our predictions actually work and feed that data back in to continuously improve the algorithms. So the second challenge I see facing the field is really a problem of data availability. So, Machine learning in tech is fundamentally different from machine learning in biology because most of human biology is still unknown. That's to say, there's a huge missing data problem. And we encountered this problem when we actually were looking at the data sets available. And we saw that these data sets were vastly underpowered and poorly designed and could not be used for machine learning. And what's important here is that the sophistication of your algorithms is irrelevant if you don't have enough data from which to train and to learn. So we've embarked on this two-year internal data generation initiative where we now generate all of our own proprietary patient data sets. And we do this by partnering with over a dozen different hospitals, brain banks, and universities to actually source thousands of patient brains after they've died, and we sequence that internally to create now one of the largest patient training data sets in the world for ALS and Parkinson's disease. 
But while training data is really important for generating predictions, for every AI company, you need to have validation data. So we take all of these predictions and we actually test them in our biology labs to create a huge body of validation data that feeds back into the algorithms and constantly improves them over time and across diseases as well. And this is critical for any company in AI and biology because AI cannot be a black box in biology. You need to have a way to actually see if the predictions work and to let those predictions guide the improvement of the actual algorithms themselves. And so the last challenge we have, sounds pretty simple, does it even work? So there's this concept in startups that there are two types of risk. There's technical risk, can you build a product? And market risk, do people want your product? And so for biotech companies, the market risk is pretty obvious. Um, if you created an Alzheimer's disease tomorrow that actually worked, you'd immediately have hundreds of millions of people clamoring to get that drug and willing to pay anything. So the biggest challenge really is technical risk, and that's huge. Does what you're predicting actually work, and will it work in a patient? And that's the biggest challenge, and that's another reason why we built out this vertical integration, because if you don't have labs, you can't test if your predictions are working. But you can't just go into a human from day one to test it. Um, and a big challenge um, in drug discovery that's led to a lot of failures are that people only test in mice before they go into humans. Um, and mice, drugs in mice historically haven't translated well in neuroscience. So what we've done instead at Verge is we've leveraged a new technology using human stem cells. And what we can do is we can actually take skin cells from patients with disease, such as Alzheimer's disease, and we can actually turn those into brain cells in a dish. And then we combine that with robotic systems internally to be able to test all of our AI predictions at scale in cheap and automated human trials before we even go to clinic. So here's one of the systems that we use to test our predictions. We plate the patient brain cells on this dish and we treat them with the drugs predicted by our platform. This robotic arm then comes along every day, takes a plate out from the incubator, and places it underneath the microscope at the same exact location. This microscope then moves along and images each well up to multiple times a day, enabling us to recreate the live growth and degeneration of individual living brain cells in real patients with ALS Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. So this is a live, uh, this is a time-lapse image from a real uh, brain cells from a real patient with ALS. And you can see here that over time, the, these white lines disintegrate into these tiny white dots. And that's the process of the cell dying. This is also the same process that causes ALS in patients. Now we can actually take these images and we can algorithmically analyze them and create these types of survival curves. So on the x-axis, you have time over the course of days. On the y-axis, you have percent of the cells that are still living. And you can see on the red line that ALS patient brain cells tend to die off much more quickly than on the black line, which are healthy patient brain cells. Now what's been so exciting for us over the last year is that when we took the first drug from our platform and we put it into these very same ALS patient brain cells, we could actually completely rescue them from dying. In fact, restoring them to the very same levels as healthy patients. This is the first time that any AI predicted drug has worked not only in mice, but also in human brain cells as well. So I kind of just want to end with, you know, where do I think biotech is going over the, the next five to 10 years? And really starting with an area that's near and dear to my heart, neurodegeneration. So I talked about some of the challenges with drug discovery. And in no other disease is it as severe as in neurodegeneration. So Alzheimer's disease currently is, is the only disease that has actual growing death rates 
And it's the only disease of top diseases in which there's no drug that can slow, prevent, or cure these diseases. And as we all get older, we'll be increasingly affected by these diseases. So why can't we figure it out? It's because these diseases are incredibly complex, and the traditional drug discovery method isn't sufficient to tackle them. In fact, in the last uh, year, there have been seven billion dollar Alzheimer's failures from Big Pharma. And in fact, last year, Pfizer announced that it was shuttering its entire neuroscience division, laying off over 300 employees. But what is less written about is the scientific and technological renaissance that's actually happening in neuroscience right now. And I think it's super interesting because anytime you have a big incumbent, that is turning away from a huge untapped market, combined with a convergence of technological advances, you create this sort of money ball opportunity for smaller companies to really come along and transform the entire landscape. Now I'll talk about a couple of these advances. The first, of course, is genomics. So in 2000, some of you might have seen this figure, in the 2000s, it cost over $100 million to sequence a single genome. Today, it costs less than $1,000. And in fact, this has dropped so quickly that it's even surpassed what's predicted by Moore's law of computing costs. And so just like the decline in computing costs has fundamentally changed the way we interact with the physical world, I think that this increase in genomic data will change the way we think about disease. Now I'm gonna talk about three additional technologies that we use at Verge to get a leg up on drug discovery. The first is that we are one of the first to actually be able to collect brain samples and sequence them from live patients with Parkinson's disease. So this is deep brain stimulation. It's an advance in surgery that allows us to implant a device into a patient's brain and turn it on to prevent Parkinson's patients from having tremors. But there's also a second unexpected uh, advantage here, which is that we can actually access patient tissue from a patient while he or she is still living and sequence it to be the first to get an unprecedented glimpse into earlier disease progression. We've also started single cell sequencing, which is a technology I think will revolutionize genomics in the next five years. So instead of sequencing patient brains at the tissue level, we can actually take individual cells and sequence their nuclei. And that, for the first time, gives us a glimpse into cell type complexity at a resolution we haven't been able to achieve before. And lastly, uh, using the same technology I showed you earlier in our lab, we're now also able to take patient skin cells and actually uh, turn them into 3D brain organoids in the lab, which allow us to model the brain in a, area, a degree of complexity we haven't seen before. So a lot of these technologies like these I will also change the type of companies that are coming out. And I think uh, these advances have already led to a proliferation of biotech companies with non-traditional profiles. So these are companies that have been started by technologists and biologists coming together and are led by savvy teams that grew up in the genomics and the AI era. Uh, these are teams that recognize the importance of creating multidisciplinary teams that interface between computer science, physics, and computational biology. And I think there'll be an explosion of these types of companies in the next five years. So I want to end with you know, while, we're, while I consider us in this kind of new era of biotech companies, uh, life sciences is still a very traditional field. Um, for example, it's very rare for there to be a founder who is also a CEO today in biotech. And most are really started by a small group of venture capital firms that bring in professional management. So in the very beginning, it was quite challenging for a company like ours to really break through. And I learned a couple really important lessons in how you can actually create an advantage from scratch. And the first thing I learned was do things that are laborious, especially in the beginning. 
Because as a founder, you will need to be the one doing things yourself to really kickstart the company. As an example, when I first started the company, uh, to hire the team, I, we, our initial team, I personally interviewed about 1,200 people myself. And I did that by actually going on Upwork.com, finding some outsourced uh, 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 people on, uh, on Upwork, and actually then going through a decade's worth of publications from Nature, Cell, Science, whatever had the word genomics in it. I found the first three authors, found their emails, and I would email out hundreds of people per week. I like to think every computational biologist has an email from me in their inbox. Um, but that was really, really, really critical for me because not only did I understand and learn the field, understand how to hire, but I was able to recruit a rock star team exactly in the mold of what I envisioned for the team. And it was after building that really stellar team that made recruiting actually so much easier after that. The next lesson is one I take, consider really important for myself personally, which is that I think it's one of my greatest responsibilities as a CEO to grow faster personally than your company does. So what do I mean that, by that? And the first thing is that you have to get really comfortable with taking a hard look at yourself and understanding what it is you're bad at, what you don't know, and what you need to learn. And you need to get really okay with that and then you need to be absolutely shameless about learning it, finding advisors, filling the gaps. And so I always like to say Verge was built on a foundation of cold emails. Um, whenever I found I didn't know anything, whether it was now business development or drug development, I would literally go and put together a list of emails of who I think is the best of the best. And I would just cold email them. Actually, very surprised by how many people responded, but that's kind of how I started building my foundation of expertise. Um, and I think the last thing is that you have to stay hungry to find stepwise functions for personal growth. So rather than trying things through trial and error, how can I find things that will really boost my own growth? And so things that have worked for me, for example, are executive coaching, reading a ton of books, and finding other founders that have gone through it. And so that brings me to my last point, which is that you know, being a founder is a very singular, it's a very challenging, and oftentimes it's a really lonely experience. And so I would not be where I was now if I did not myself find a group of other founders that would eventually become my best friends with the shared experiences. So these are people that I would literally text at midnight and feel like, crap, I have to fire someone for the first time. How do I fire someone? And then I would text someone like, I just fired someone. Does anyone want to grab a drink? <laughs> <laughs> so these are people that really have seen, we've seen each other's companies really from beginning all the way through. Our friend's company was just acquired last week. Uh, so that's a picture taken last week. And I think this is so important because as a founder, it's really, really hard to know where to get good advice. You're gonna to be told what to do by your investors, by your advisors, by your employees, none of which are sure has the company's best interest at heart. And so I think the best advice I've always gotten have been from other founders that have gone through the same thing, especially founders that are about a year or two ahead of me. Uh, and that's really the best way to kind of anticipate what you don't know. And lastly, I feel like building a important, building a personal uh, support network for yourself is really key to actually building a sustainable business across time because you will need places to look for advice throughout the whole entire journey. So I'll start taking questions now. <laughs>